welcome, one and all. I invite you to take your seats as we start off song team with Ferris Lord Jesus. Praise 
pray together. Lord, we're here, and I pray, Lord, give us hearts to hear and eyes to see. I thank you for a beautiful day, and thank you for a place where we can gather and sing. And now, Lord, I pray, may we hear you speaking to our hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, it's been a little while, but uh, I can remember a lady coming over from the Eastern Bloc countries of Europe when communism was reigning and the privilege to get together and sing. You sure don't want to take it for granted. They couldn't. And uh, for years they had to hide out and when they gathered it had to be in small groups and they couldn't sing out because they'd be heard. Tonight I want to uh, take you on a journey in the Word of God, and uh, it happens to be my most favorite story in the Bible, and you've heard sermons on it before, but tonight I'm going to take you on a journey where we trust the Holy Spirit will speak to you. If you have your Bibles and you want to open up to the Gospel of John, chapter 4, John chapter 4, I want to look at the woman at the well, but I kind of want to do it through some new eyes. So I have an old Bible, and because I was going to do the week of prayer here, I brought it. I don't like to take it out anymore. It's probably 10, 12 years old. The binding's coming apart. I've tried to fix it. But I spent three years reading this Bible. And when you spend three years reading a Bible and you go slow and you pray and you look some things up and you study and you're reading something, you say, oh, I read something about that over there. And um, I learned so much. And I've marked it up. And I, I don't, when I come to do a week of prayer, I don't have notes up here. I can look on my computer for some of my notes, but I've written things in my Bible. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the Bible is a sword. And this is a new, 
uh, this is New American Standard Version of the Bible, which is a very accurate version of the Bible, by the way. Uh, if you read this Bible and you get out the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentaries, you're going to often see in the commentary, it'll say, literally, the verse says, and that's very close to how it reads right here in the New American Standard. Now, I'm going to talk to you over the next few days about a few people in the Bible. I'm going to, my wife asked me what I was talking about with you up here. And um, I think there's three things we could summarize. I want you to know God. I want you to know yourself. And I want you to be able to know somebody else. I want you especially to be able to get to the place where you can be emotionally close to the people that matter to you, and especially maritally. Now, marriage is a few years off for most of you, and a little more for some of you, but the preparation for marriage is now. So, knowing God, knowing yourself, and being able to know somebody else on an emotional basis. Now, I contend that the people who get the best lives are the ones that learn to listen to God. And uh, after 39 years of marriage almost, I can tell you that uh, when my wife and I do marriage seminars, we tell people, you get to choose. It's like a car. You get to choose which kind of car you go through life in. And years ago, back in the 80s, the Yugoslavians, no offense to any uh, Eastern Europeans that are here tonight, but the Yugoslavians made a car called the Yugo. And if you want to look it up online, it was a very short-lived American car because the Yugo didn't go very far. It was a super poor quality car. Uh, that was back when communism was reigning. And uh, you get to decide. I mean, when I was a poor college kid, I drove Ford Pintos. Does anybody know what a Ford Pinto was? It was a uh, rolling incendiary device because if you ran into them in the back, they'd blow up. And uh, because of that, they were cheap. Nobody really wanted them. So I owned two or three of them over a course of time. I learned how to work on cars. But you get to decide. If life, if life has a metaphor, you get to decide which kind of car you go through life in. You can go through in a jalopy or a junker, or you can go through in a really nice Lamborghini or Maserati or whatever car you think you want to go through. The difference is how much it costs to own one of those cars. And tonight I'm going to show you, if you want to develop emotional intimacy, if you want to respect yourself, if you want to be in a great relationship where you keep the respect, and by the way, ladies, I'll say this several times, but I want you to know something. The Bible says that beauty is fading. Did you know that? Proverbs 31. But you know what it says? It says all those things are fading, but a woman that loves and serves the Lord is somebody that remains attractive all their life. Now, that's the very loose Ron Kelly paraphrase, but I'm going to tell you something. For you ladies, you need to remember that respect is the center of attraction. And once you lose respect in the eyes of a man whether it's your dad, brother, friend, especially a husband, once you lose your self-respect, it's all downhill from there. It doesn't matter how pretty you are. Um, so I'm going to talk about this tonight. And what I want to tell you is, is that the people who have to go through life in jalopies are people who aren't willing to suffer. They're not willing to hang on when the going gets rough and make it through the rough spots relationally. And I'm going to show you from this story, this lady... Now, I decided a long time ago, because I grew up poor and I drove junkers. I mean, we had an old Chevrolet. I told you about sitting in that Chevy today when my, my mother, my grandpa, had her by the hair and was beating on her. Uh, I think it might have been that car. It had an automatic transmission, a big 350. I know everything's liters and kilometers up here, but in America, we still do cubic inches. And um, it, it had a 5.7, there we go, liter V8 in it, and it ran so poorly that when every time you put it in drive, the thing would die. So I can remember going to church school, my mother would sit at the light, she'd put it in neutral, and she'd be revving it like I'm in a, we're about to be in a drag race. And she'd throw that thing into gear, and whew, we were out of there. It was so embarrassing. If, it, if she didn't get the revs right, it would kind of lurch into the intersection and die. <laughs> I feel sorry for people who've never been poor. All right? It's good to be poor. Being poor gives you an appreciation. It's an education. Now, I don't want to stay poor. But don't worry. If you cooperate with God, you typically won't stay poor unless you choose to be poor because you're just sacrificing a lot. But I grew up poor. It's like, man, I don't want to go through life in that. 
And I'm, I'm here to tell you before it's all done, I'm going to tell you how I met my wife. I'm going to tell you the hard things about courting her and dating her. Uh, I don't know how much I'll say about the marriage except to say after 39 years, you go through some real wonderful highs and some real painful lows. And you've got to be committed. You've got to suffer. And Christians are the best ones who know how to suffer because Jesus, their prince, is the prince of suffering. And why did he suffer? He suffered for love. He suffered for truth. He stood up to those people. And he stood up for the people that they would never, ever want to deal with. Choose, choose, though. If there's one thing I want you to know, you get to decide. You want to have a good marriage? You decide. Now it takes two. And sometimes one's not willing. So I've dealt with a lot in 35 years of ministry. When I used to tell these stories and preach these sermons, it was all out of books. Now I'm preaching these sermons out of life experience. And I actually know something, which is why you're supposed to stand up in the presence of a gray-headed man found in the way of righteousness. Because life's the ultimate teacher if you're willing to learn. All right, let's look at a lady who was going through life in a jalopy. All right, go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. And let's go on a quick journey here. It says, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees... Oh, I didn't read my quote. That's why I had the Bible open there. Listen to this. Review and Herald, January 19. You got to get God right or you don't get marriage right and friendship right. Here you go. Christ has instructed us to call God our Father. We know that. But depending on what kind of dad you have, you might need a little tweaking to your image. And to regard him, here's a good quote. I never thought about this quote being at Fountain View. And to regard him as the fountain of. Now this is from Ellen White. This is an inspired writing. I'm at Fountain View. And I want you to fill in the blank. God wants you to regard him as the fountain of what? You got your word? One word. What's your word? I bet, unless you've listened to me preach this sermon, I never even knew about this quote for probably the first 40 years of my life. Somebody be brave. What's your word? Fountain of what? Fountain of life. Good. What else? Anybody? Fountain of love. That's a good one. Anybody else? Fountain of music. Well, yes, he is that too. He rejoices over us with singing. What, and it's not the word that's here, though. What else? Love, yeah. What was another one? Faith, yeah. Those are all good. Here's the word, and I want you to remember it. We are to regard the Father as the fountain of affection. Affection. Now, I married the most affectionate woman in the world. And it's a good thing, because I told you earlier this morning that my mother, I, I've never doubted her love, but my mother is not affectionate. Rebellious people have a problem with being affectionate. Their emotional self is all bound up in anger and fighting back. But I married a fountain of affection. But I'm telling you, what the quote says is, we regard him as the fountain of affection. And by the way, affection is different than love. Affection is different than love. My mother loved me, and I got whoopings sometimes. All right, anybody get a whooping in here? Whoopings are part of life, okay? You don't need lots of them, usually. And they're not to go to discipline. Although if you raise a bunch of boys, you may do it more than... I have three boys. And uh, they like to tease me about how much I whooped them when they were kids. They're all successful now. And I think they're kind of proud of themselves, but they like to make fun of their dad a little bit. They respect me. They love me. But affection's different than love. There are times when my wife loves me, but she's mad at me. Times I'm mad at her. But I tell you what, affection is a warm expressiveness of love that's like... It's like the dessert in life. And when I go by my wife in the house, she always reaches out and touches me. She might give me a hug. She might give me a kiss. She might say something nice to me. My wife is a fountain of affection, and I don't ever get tired of it. Never. As a matter of fact, when I opened my suitcase here, there was a little note in it from my wife, a little love note, a little affection note. I love getting her hugs and kisses. I love her words of affirmation. She's got to tell me the truth sometimes. Uh, she's not lying when she affirms me, but affection is beautiful. Now, some of you don't like it, and I had to get used to it. 
I can tell you one thing I didn't like when my wife and I got married. Her family is very affectionate. My family was kind of dysfunctional. Her family wasn't noticeably dysfunctional. They had a few things I learned about as time went on, okay? But my wife had a bad habit. At least for me, it was a bad habit. Her family would pat each other on the shoulder, put their arm pat. I felt because I was, I came out of a less healthy home, I felt like I was being patted like a dog. I felt demeaned by it. I had to tell her because that wasn't really making me feel affirmed. But I got over it now. If my wife wants to pat me on the shoulder, it's okay. She's about a foot shorter than me. And uh, we worked out three things. I want everybody to know three things. You want good relationships? Trust, respect, and affection for a marriage. Trust, don't break it. Respect, be sure to keep it. And affection, give away a lot of love, a lot of love. You're, not, you're never wasting words when you share affirming words with somebody you love. Now, don't be a flatterer. And don't do it to get what you want. But God is the fountain of affection. And the quote goes on to say, he's the source of all the love that's been flowing from century to century through the channel of the human heart. And all the pity and compassion and the love that's been manifested in the earth have had their source in God. And compared to the love that dwells in his heart, all the human hearts are as a fountain to the ocean. His love is perpetually flowing forth to make the weak strong and to give courage to the wavering. Now, I'm going to show you how to look at the Bible characters through the fountain of affection. Because if you don't see God the right way, you're going to have a hard time getting close to anybody. And if you don't really see God the right way, you're going to have a hard time really being sorry and having a gift of repentance. Because I'm convinced it's awfully hard to be truly repentant to somebody you don't really like or somebody you're afraid of. But when you hurt somebody you love, and you see those tears well up in their eyes. And you feel like a heel. And you say to yourself, I'll never do that again. I'll tell you what. If you don't get God right, the rest of life's not too good. And there's a lot of Seventh-day Adventists right out now. They don't have God right. I'm going to talk with you about alien bonds. I'm going to talk with you about the bonding process. A lot of our Seventh-day Adventist church, including some of your parents, hate to say it, I don't know them. But it's got to be somewhat true, even though they put you in this really wonderful school. And outside of the Fountain View network, just life in general, there's a lot of people who have an alien bond with the world. What do I mean by an alien bond? When I'm married to Colleen, that's my wife's name, and somebody else, and there are other pretty women in the world, when I allow my heart to go out to somebody else, and I emotionally begin to bond with them, that's an alien bond. And I'm going to talk with you about it. Not tonight, although the, the story has some of it in it. When you have an alien bond, I mean, I, just, I, I learned so many things on the job. What I learned is, is that women, close your ears, men, women will put up with clowns for husbands for about two decades. They will. Big boys. And by the way, there's a lot of big boys out there. Bachelors. And they want to stay big boys all their life. And they're addicted to their video games and their sports. And they don't get up and help do the dishes or any of those kinds of things. And I'm here to tell you, there's a lot of women who in the name of submission and love, so-called, they make their own mistakes by not maintaining the respect factor. I talked to you about that. They'll stay married to them for about 20 years. And then finally when the kids are gone, they're done. And when I say done... I mean, they're done. They endured being with that person for so long. Of course, they made a big mistake. Typically, there's a respect problem here. And they allowed him to continue living like a big bachelor. But finally, they're so fed up that when the kids are gone, they're gone, and nothing you say. All the king's horses and all the king's men can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And it's really sad. And if they would have learned how to stand up to him in the first week of marriage, it might have turned out different. All right, fountain of affection. Let's come back here. I'm going to tell stories all night long, and I'm not going to tell you the story in the Bible. So Jesus was baptizing, verse 1 says, but he left because the word on the street was that 
Jesus was making more baptizes, more baptisms than John, although he himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. He left Judea, and he went away into Galilee, and he had to come through Samaria. Now, get a look. Pay attention. Jesus is a very thoughtful person. He does not want to make the Pharisees insecure by becoming more popular than even John was. So he quits. He wanted to reach those Pharisees. And he leaves. And he's going to go to Judea. But the Bible said he had to pass through Samaria. Now you've heard sermons on this before. Did he have to pass through Samaria? No. No. Because most Jews didn't want to go through Samaria because the Samaritans were considered spiritual half-breeds. Remember back when Nehemiah was trying to build the temple? The Samaritans, they were kind of a conglomeration. They were kind of the new agey religious group of the day. And we had a big split back when they were trying to rebuild the temple. You can't help us. We don't have anything to do with you. Consequentially, the Samaritans became... It was a race thing and a religion thing. And you don't have to be black or white or Hispanic or Indian or Native American or whatever you are. People find ways to hate each other, but not Christians. So Jesus decided he needed to go through Samaria. Why? Because he had an appointment. Now, I'm going to give you the real brief view of Shechem, Samaria, Sychar. I want to remind you what went on there. Number one, this is the place where God met Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis. Number two, this is where, uh, right after Jacob meets Esau, he settles in Shechem. That's in Genesis chapter 33, 35. It's in Shechem that Dinah falls in love with the sons of Shechem. Okay, Shechem and Sychar, different names for the same place. This is where we're at. I need you to know where we're at. And of course, terrible things happen there. I'm not going to go into how terrible, but... Very inappropriate. This is also the place where uh, Jacob tells everybody after these terrible things happen with the Shechemites, take off your earrings, he recommits to God. Shechem is where the Israelites will gather. Six tribes on Mount Gerizim, six tribes on Mount Ebal. The well of Sychar or Shechem is right down here. And six tribes will read the blessings of Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28. And six tribes will read the curses. And so you have this antiphonal renewal of the covenant right here at Shechem. Like this is the most identifiable place in the Bible where Jesus actually was. We know that. The well is still there. It's 135 feet deep and it's still producing water. This is a well dug by Jacob and his men. I mean, this is an amazing thing that this story about water, about the well of life coming up in you is the most identifiable place in all of Bible topography And it's still there, and there's still water. And Jesus had to go there because he knew there was a rejected woman there who was a woman of truth. Now listen to me. I preach this story in various prisons. And in the prisons, as soon as I start talking with them about giving somebody back their self-respect, these are prisoners. I want to tell you, their ears and their eyes are riveted on what I'm saying. There's a woman in this place who is so bad, we really ought to call this story the story of the bad Samaritan. She's so bad that she's been with five men, and the sixth one's not her husband. She's been rejected over and over and over and over again. And I'm going to tell you why. She's not glamorous. She feels cheap and trashy. Remember I told you I've learned a lot pastoring? I had a lady sit in my office once. She had been married five times too. You know why? Because she couldn't stand to go through life without a man in her life. She so doubted herself and her value that somebody else had to give it to her. You know why? I'm going to say this kind of cryptically. Because when she was a young woman, a male church school teacher was inappropriate with her. And from that point forward in her life, she felt like dirt. And so the only way she could get value, since she felt dirty herself, was for somebody else to say, usually because of her looks, 
This lady was a pretty woman that was sitting in my office. My guess is this was an attractive woman in the story. And the only way she could get any worth was through her outer person because she so doubted herself. But you know what happens with people who doubt their self-worth? Listen to me, especially you girls, listen to me. When you doubt your self-worth, you have a hard time projecting self-value, which is very close to self-respect. But all of you need to know you were made special by God. And there's a special person for you if you are to be married. Many of you will be. Maybe not all of you. But when you don't know the great value that you have, you can't project it into a marriage relationship. And so eventually these people treated her like a doormat. And then probably the relationships all started immorally. And by the way, if you start a relationship immorally, it's kind of hard to get it back on the road. It'd be like driving a 4 by 4 into a swamp. 4 by 4s can't go everywhere. And so here's a woman. She's so bad, she doesn't want to run into anybody she knows, so she comes to the well at lunch. Now, mind you, I hear it gets pretty hot here. Somebody told me here it, gets to, it got up to 120-some degrees one year. I just came from El Salvador. It was 98 degrees every day. And I want to tell you what we did. We decided that we weren't going to work from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. We decided to get up early and go out to work at 6 a.m. Because at 1 o'clock or 12 o'clock, it's very hot. And water's very heavy. <laughs> but this lady doesn't care. She'd rather carry water in the heat of the day than run into anybody who knows her. Because everybody who knows her is going to treat her like she's a piece of trash. And the truth of the matter is, she feels like one. And now she can't even get the guy she's with to marry her. But she meets Jesus. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. I think he sent them away on purpose. I don't think he wanted them there. I think they would have messed it up. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, now, he's a Jew. You have to remember, she doesn't like Jews. So she's got enough chutzpah to treat him disrespectfully. How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews, uh, John put this in, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And then Jesus answers, said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now it's interesting because you know what? You each have a, 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 an environment around you. Ellen White will say that there's a, it's not like the New Agers and the occult people. You all have a spirit around you. Hopefully it's the Holy Spirit. And what you need to know is that people can figure out in a very few seconds after they're around you whether or not there's a beauty. There's a beauty in a Christian that shows through. All right? You, you don't have to have words to show it. I mean, I can be walking through a store, and uh, it doesn't matter what race somebody is, because the Spirit of God, I've invited him in, I'm happy and I'm pleasant, and I smile at people, and a lot of them smile back at me, and it's pleasant. Imagine if you're God himself, there's such a beauty about Jesus that this woman senses there's something different before he even starts talking. He said, I would have given you something to drink. <laughs> now she's skeptical, sir. You have nothing to draw with, and the well's deep. 135 feet, 44 meters. Where then do you go to get that living water? Now here comes a little zinger. Remember, he's in her territory. He's on her turf. Here comes the zinger. You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? I mean, you Jews, you look down your nose at us. But Jacob's our father too, who gave us this well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. And Jesus answered and said to her, here it gets really deep, everyone who drinks of this water is going to get thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him is never going to thirst. But the water that I give to him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And by now, she senses he's different enough to take a risk. Did you hear me? To take a risk. When you sit somebody, by somebody on an airplane, when you run to somebody in a grocery store, when you're in a place 
You know, people hate to be sold religion and they hate to get caught where they're forced to take it from you. But she's decided she's opening the door of her heart. The woman said, sir, give me this water so I won't be thirsty nor have to come all the way to drill, to, to draw. And he said to her, oh man, why does Jesus do this? Go get your husband and come back. Oh man, it was going good. Her head drops. She doesn't want to meet his eyes. She's got to decide. Am I going to tell the truth? And I'm going to tell you something. You want a good relationship? You can't hide from God. Number one, God knows everything about you. He knows your family system. He knows everything you've done, good or bad. But remember, he's the fountain of affection. He's not the condemner. He's the redeemer. He wants you in heaven. Doesn't matter how you are right now. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter where you come from. But now her head drops. She can't look at him. She's going to be a piece of trash again. She's either going to lie or she's going to have to walk away. She gets somewhere in the middle. <laughs> the woman answered and said, this was pretty, lady sharp. She doesn't want to leave the living water, but she doesn't want to tell him everything. And she says, I'm not married. And Jesus said to her, I know. You've been with five married men who were your husbands, and now you're living with someone. And I want to tell you, her head snaps up. Her eyes get wide. She's talking with somebody that can read a soul. This is the God man. And he knows every single thing about this woman, and that's why he's there. You remember in Samaria, they didn't want to give him food once. And James and John said, Lord, let's do that Elijah thing. Call fire down on him. And Jesus says, you don't even know what kind of spirit motivated those words. He loves the Samaritans. They don't. Do you have people you don't love? Do you have people you'd write off? Jesus is God. He's the fountain of affection. You've said correctly, I have no husband. You've had five. The one you now have is not your husband. In this you've said truly. And of course, he was number seven, which is no small detail to live out. That lady snaps her head up and looks at Jesus wondering what is going on here. But I'm here to tell you it's no different for you or me. There's nothing secret between you and God. The woman said, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Now she wants to change the subject. No more digging into the private side of my life. I want to tell you something. I don't care what family system you came out of. It hurts to heal. I once did premarital counseling, a big, strong, strapping dude. And a nice young woman who was a teacher. The problem is, before he met this girl, he hadn't been walking with God. And he had done a lot of things that he regretted. He had been with a lot of women. So let me ask you a question, ladies. Can people change? Yes or no? What do you think, ladies? Can people change? Yes or no? Yes, they can. So let's imagine you're the woman sitting in the uh, premarital counseling seat. Let's say you, you fall in love with a man who in the early part of his life was not good, but gave his heart to Christ and discovered that you are a beautiful person and wants your hand in marriage. Is it possible you could have a good marriage with this person, yes or no? Yeah, you could, converted person. But now, if they're not converted, what are the odds? Don't they kind of like drop off the chart? So I started probing a little bit about this. Because it was my opinion, and probably most of you women would agree, it was my opinion that the woman who had kept herself pure had a right to know at least something 
Now, it's my opinion she has a right to know anything she wants to know about his past life. I think that's how it works. I'm about to give you my life. I'm going to share everything, even my body with you. I think she had a right to know. But he didn't want to talk about it. So I said, so how's it going to work when you go to an alumni and some pretty little thing that was in your former life comes walking up to you with that twinkle in her eye and that, you know, feminine mystique says, well, hey, Billy, that was not his name. How are you doing? And his new wife, standing by his side, watches this conversation and thinks it's kind of unique and weird. And then when she wanders off, he says, she says to her new husband, who was that? What was that all about? Doesn't the person who's going to marry somebody who lived like that have a right to find out what they want to know about it before they make a promise? Yeah. He didn't want to tell. And I don't think he ever did. Would you be surprised if I told you? He worked for the TSA. Would you be surprised if I told you not too many years farther down the line they were divorced? It's hard to grow. It's hard to heal. And Jesus gave her a chance. And you know what he said? You're going to be honest with me? I'm going to test you. Go get your husband. She bows her head. I don't have one. He says, I know. Your family system got problems? Welcome to the human race. Some have more than others. Good news is, doesn't matter what family system you came from, if you could be honest about it, you can grow. My father-in-law's passed away. He was a great man. But he had a few peculiarities. He was a gymnast when he was a young man. He had the, some of the fastest reflexes of anybody I knew. And I'm not going to tell you really serious things about my family because some of those are private and sacred. But I'll tell you something kind of simple. My father-in-law would never admit when he was getting tired while he was driving. And the car would start wandering off the road. And my dad had driven a motorcycle, and he was Mr. Super Hypersonic Defensive Driver. And so my father-in-law scared me to death. And when I saw him going like this and rubbing the back of his head, it's like he's getting tired. He would never admit he was getting tired caused a little bit of friction between my wife and I. Now, I'm telling you, my wife came out of a family so much better than mine, it's not even funny. But there was one thing good, at least, that I brought to the marriage. <laughs> and that's because I wasn't raised by Christians and because I had to be my own person. Even in my home, I had to fight my backslidden mother. She made me go to that church school. I met Jesus, and guess what? She got bumped out of the way as the highest authority in my life. And I want to tell you, she told me, go get me a pack of cigarettes. No, I'm not going to the store to get you cigarettes anymore. <laughs> Once, coming home from church, under 16, my backslidden dad offers to stop and buy us an ice cream cone at Dairy Queen. Now, I had been taught that on Sabbath, you don't do any financial transacting. Now, here I am, I'm probably 14 years old, and I tell my dad on a hot July day, <laughs> I don't want any ice cream. Most 14-year-olds don't do that. My mother got so mad at me. My mother, the one who gave me this value system. I won't go into a lot of details now, but I'm going to talk to you about some of the very unpleasant. My dad's dead, too. He was a good man most of the time. But I've seen some really bad things. My wife's family never saw those things. But my wife's family had a tendency of not being really honest about, I don't say they lied, but they weren't very good at talking about their real emotions and some of the problems that were in the, the relationship. They had an A-plus life. I grew up in a C-minus, D-plus home. But the one thing I brought to my marriage was honesty. And I wasn't going to drive around in a junker anymore. And I can tell you, after four decades of being married, my wife is a stronger, better woman and leader that I respect immensely. 
and I'm a much more gentle, kind pastor. I needed some of what she had. She needed some of what I had. But if you're not honest, you can't get there. And do you know how you get honest? If you, if you were raised in this church, if you're attending Fountain View Academy, you talk to God honestly. God allows you to explore your own heart. Think about all the people who don't have God. They don't know their value. You know what God did for me? God showed me I had value. So if I had problems, it's okay. He can fix them. I've got value. I'm made different than all of you. I was made to be a preacher. I didn't know it. I found out in church school. <laughs> then I didn't want to be a preacher, but that's a story for another day. But I'm here to tell you, God gives you value, and then you can admit your problems. But some people can't. They've been so demeaned in their family system. They've so doubted themselves. Something's happened to them they've never talked about. So they have no value. Jesus requires you to be honest, to receive the gospel, and to grow from wherever you're at to wherever you want to be. And that's why he said, go get your husband. Now, she wants to change the subject matter, and she wants to argue like a good Sabbath school class about where to go to church. Let's read it. She says, our fathers, verse 20, worshiped on this mountain, and you people. Now, people is a supplied word. The nice thing about the New American Standard Bible is that like the King James, it'll show you the supplied words. And if I said, if I was, if I was, if I said to you, you fountain view people, you people, it's usually bad coming after that. Jesus, uh, Jesus has to talk to her. She says, look, Jacob worshiped right here. Abraham worshiped right here. They renewed the covenant right here. This is probably the most sacred place in all of Israel. She says, you people say Jerusalem is the only place where we ought to worship. And what does Jesus say? Oh, don't want to have an argument with this lady. I'm witnessing. No. Jesus is going to tell her the truth again. Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Now listen to this. This is not the best witnessing line. You're ignorant. You don't know what you're worshiping. I didn't use that on the lady sitting next to me on the plane from Los Angeles to Vancouver. She was a development director for a Christian academy somewhere in British Columbia. I didn't say to her, you're ignorant about the fourth commandment. The more you love people, though, and the more you know them, the more direct you can be. You worship what you don't know. We worship what we know. Salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, two times in this, the conversation could have ended. She could have said, I'm not talking to you anymore. You're asking me about my private life and telling me things you shouldn't know. And now you're telling me that my faith heritage is bunk. It's confused. But the way he did it, and the person he was, the spirit, the atmosphere that surrounded him was beautiful and respectful. And when I talk to those prisoners, when I'm in a prison, they're sitting there listening because they want their self-respect back. And of course, it doesn't matter what you've done. You may have done some things that cause you to question your self-respect. I do sometimes. Now she's going to take a big risk. But she's a person of truth. How does this happen? You live like she lived, and there's still something, a flame burning in you. Woman, she said. The woman said to him, I know Messiah is going to come. And when that one comes, he'll declare us all things. And she said to him, he said to her, you're talking to the Messiah. Now the disciples come, and they're amazed. Why is he talking? But they didn't say anything to her, and they didn't say anything to him. So the woman leaves her water part, and she goes into the city. And the Bible's pretty detailed here. She goes only to the men. Come see a man. It says in verse 29, she said to the men. There's a reason. The women were disgusted by her. How many marriages had she broken up? I don't know. Who is it? I don't know her name. We'll call her Rachel. They know her voice. 
As soon as they hear her, they are disgusted. Go away! No, you need to listen to me. There's someone out at the well who knows every bad thing I've ever done with you. What? That's not a very normal uh, witnessing line. But she goes around to all the men. And of course, the Bible doesn't say that she says, come meet a man who told me every bad thing I ever did. But that's kind of the story. They, come to, they can see a new look in her eyes. There's a new spirit in her heart. She's found Christ. And the Bible says they all come out. And they came for a couple days. And the disciples say to Jesus, eat something. And Jesus says, I can't. There's something going on here. And they don't get into it. They can't. My will, he said, is to do the will of him who sent me. They're out there for two days. And I'm going to end with a story. I got on an airplane in Minneapolis back when there was such a thing as uh, Northwest Airlines. I was flying to Denver. I had flown from Indianapolis. And um, I sat down to a man in the middle. He was in the middle seat. I was on the aisle. He had a big blue and white jersey with the number 1-8 on it. It was an Indianapolis Peyton Manning jersey. And uh, I was from Cicero at that point in time, which was close to Indianapolis. And I sat down by him. And back then, everybody didn't have cell phones. Nowadays, you have about 15 seconds to find out if someone wants to talk to you. If they put their phone away or they say something to you, there's a chance. If they sit there with it, looking at it, never saying anything to you, a conversation's not going to happen. But he, uh, he struck up a conversation with me, and it wasn't long until I found out he went to a church where you could do whatever you want. I thought, oh, great. <laughs> it's the worst kind of religion. It's the religion that takes the cross out of the journey. But we started talking, and after a while... He never did ask me, I don't think, about my job, but I found out he was flying to Denver, Colorado, where he was going to pick up a brand new Volvo tractor. Not like field tractor, but, you know, tractor trailer. And I, I, I kept talking to him. And uh, pretty soon, he was talking to me about driving through the mountains in Colorado and parking in Walmart parking lots and seeing bunny rabbits and moose. And I thought... This is a big, strong, strapping dude. Which big, you know, going to the gym? I, why, those men don't talk about bunny rabbits, do they? I mean, bunny rabbits, that's what little kids say. And I thought to myself, he had a, uh, he had a pretty tender upraising. And then pretty soon, I asked him about his, his church school experience. And he said, yeah, I went to a I, I, school. He said, I went to a religious school. The kids weren't very nice to me. By the way, friends, when I said I had the book of Job and everybody laughed at me, that was all I needed to say, you know what, this is not the fountain of affection here. I never heard the quote before, but it's like, I don't want to be here. Uh, the people going to school here, there may be somebody going to school here right now. You want a witness for Christ? Just find somebody that feels a little more out of place than you do and be nice to them. It's simple. But he got a real bad taste. And I asked him about his mom. He wasn't married said, yeah, my mom works in a hotel. She could really be pretty high up, but she has a problem. Well, what's the problem? She won't work on Saturday. Now the picture's starting to come to me. Okay. <laughs> that was a Seventh-day Adventist church school he went to. And his mom is a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And pretty soon he asked me what I did. I said, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist minister and... I think what I said was, <laughs> I'm here today as an answer to your mother's prayers. <laughs> I'm sitting next to this guy because some dear mama out there raised him up to be a good little boy, to grow into a good man. But he's gone off on his own track doing his own thing, but mama's still faithful. And you know, he probably was mistreated in school some, Hang around your family. Your own family mistreats you sometimes. What makes you think you're not occasionally get mistreated in the church? We flew all the way to Denver, talked almost the whole way. I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God put me in contact with that person 
as a complete, absolute, divine function of a lot of prayers that his mother may, his mother may not even know he sat by a Seventh-day Adventist pastor for two hours. I don't know what became of him. I, I do plenty of counseling. You know what I tell everybody that goes in and out of my office? I'm going to tell you the best I know. I'm going to share the principles with you. And then you know what you got to do? you got to pray to know how to apply the principles I shared with you. Because people are kind of funny. They tell you what they want you to know. <laughs> the thing about pastoral counseling that's better, if you, need, if you need psychological counseling, don't be embarrassed about it. Go get it. But the counselor has to spend about 10 sessions trying to figure you out. And the pastor usually has got a lot of life experience with you as a parishioner. Every single person listening to me here tonight, you're going to do something somewhere in your life where all of a sudden you're going to say, how did I do that? You're going to wonder, how could I have done that, watched that, read that, said that? Christ lives to give you back your dignity. He loves you, and he has the power to heal you from the inside out. It doesn't matter what was done to you. Could be physical, could be mental, could be relational, could be spiritual. The living Christ wants us to know his Father is the fountain of affection. And I tell you, when you get around especially an affectionate mother in Israel, an affectionate mom, an affectionate wife. Men can be affectionate too. And we need to guard the boundaries of how that works. You know, my wife can be very affectionate with me. She's my wife, and I can be very affectionate with her. But I'm here to tell you, there are times when it's like, I don't deserve affection, I deserve condemnation and shame. But God forgives me. He restores my dignity. He tells me, I love you. I know everything about you, and I love you. And that kind of love has the power to make you a different husband, a different wife, a different son, a different daughter, a different leader in the church, a different teacher. I'm here to tell you, Christianity works. It was Gandhi who said, I like your Christ, I just don't like your Christians. Real Christianity can't be stopped. Because it's full of truth and love. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. The purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, a conscience that's clean, and a faith that can be seen. I'm here to tell you tonight, God knows way more than your name. He loves you. He's got a plan for you. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. doesn't matter what happened to you in the past. If you can be honest about it. Man, there's things in my life I don't ever want anybody to know. In my marriage relationship, there have been moments when I've had to say to my wife, man, I can't believe this. But I am so glad that Jesus went out of his way to meet a bad Samaritan at the most sacred place in all of Israel to say, you know what, I really think, I really think John chapter 4 is there. John chapter 3 is Nicodemus. John chapter 4 is Jesus saying to a bad Samaritan woman, I want to restore the covenant with you. I want you to know, I came out of my way to find you today. I'm God. You're my child. That's what he's doing for all of us. The fountain of affection. Kind of a good quote from Fountain View Academy. Let's pray. Lord, it doesn't matter where we've come from, but we do have to be honest about it. Otherwise, how can it ever get fixed? But the principles of love, which are both kind and true, firm and gracious, a God who was so kind and nice but could not abandon the truth that would set this lady free. Thank you for the healing, Lord. I'm just praying now for everybody in this room, including myself, thank you that you restore our dignity, that you forgive our sins and you make us children of God. And I'm just praying, Lord, because the seventh day of his church is sick because we have a lot of cultural Adventism, which isn't automatically bad, but if we don't really have your heart, 
and we don't do justly and love mercy and walk humbly, we just kind of drift off into something that can't impact the world. So bless us. Bless the students tonight as they study, as, as they rest. Bless the teachers and the staff. Bless us all. And help us to remember, Lord, you would have died for just one, just me. And you know us in ways we don't even know ourselves. So may we be willing to let you be Lord of all things. In the present, Lord over the past as a healer, and in the future. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.